All right, welcome everyone. My name is Haley Buckner and I'm a preventive care consultant supervisor for Elevate Oral Care. We are honored to have Dr. Brooke Bukioka as our speaker today. Dr. Brooke has founded an interdisciplinary operating room program in partnership with her local hospital and a mobile teledental daily oral hygiene program in partnership with local long-term care facilities. She uses the portable clinic and teledentistry to take care of geriatric patients in long-term care facilities. She has a team of five, which consists of two assistants, two expanded access hygienists, and herself. She and her team pride themselves on increasing the quality of life for adults who have special needs and geriatric patients who have limited mobility through advocacy, access to comprehensive dental care, and education. So with that, I'm going to welcome you, Dr. Brooke Fugioka. Well, hey, everybody. These are just some pictures from my practice here during the coronavirus. This patient here, and I hope you can see my pointer there. Um, this patient here, she has Alzheimer's, and this is her husband visiting her through the window. And this is actually one of my favorite patients. Every time we come, he helps us move our mobile equipment in. Such a great guy. And so I just put these pictures up here to illustrate that we are trying to treat these patients through what may seem to be locked doors. And this presentation is going to focus exclusively on our long-term care facilities and how we can take care of our patients in those long-term care facilities during this pandemic situation. So what to expect? Usually when I do courses, I do courses live. And in a live course, I can tell if you like my jokes or if you don't like my jokes. But in an online course, I just kind of am going to roll with it. And if you don't like my jokes, I apologize. I have no way of knowing. Um, so I thought with online being new to me, it might be new to some of you guys. I do a lot of my courses live. I do watch some webinars, but I thought we would go through the world of online CE before we get started. We have all of our different presenter types here, and I think I probably fit into each of these at some point, but you can see here we have the professional whose picture looks very, very beautiful. Then we look on screen and look like a mess. That's probably me. Um, we've got the webinar mullet. I think that term was made by Dr. Jeanette McLean with the you know, looking nice on the top and then pajamas on the bottom because you can't see the bottom half. We've got the scene setter. We've got the person who wants to make themselves look very smart with all the fancy stuff in the background. There's me when I tried to do that. I think that, and you'll see if you stay till the very end, you'll see our video where we have the books in the background trying to look real smart there. And then we have the beginner where I had no idea that the camera was going as I was presenting and I had my Angry Bird pajamas on. And of course the tech hater, when you're trying to figure out the technology and you just can't get it to work. So th that's the world of online CE presenter types. But then there's also the world of online CE learner types where we have the, of course, the push play and walk away. I think you people are already gone. We have the people who are asleep. Hopefully I haven't lost you yet because it's been one minute and 30 seconds. But we have the avid learner. Those people are going to stay on afterwards for the end of the presentation. And then, of course, we have the tech haters in both worlds where we just can't get our stuff to work. We've got the multitasker. This is the person who's got their video games on one side and they've got their CE on the other side. I'm not sure which one's getting more attention. And the pet owner where you're doing CE through possibly a cat. So those are our CE online learner and presenter types. You can put yourself in whatever category that you'd like here for the rest of our CE. And another thing that I like to tell people is that this today is gonna to be about long-term care facilities and what we're doing to help you know, encourage oral health and to keep our presence in the long-term care facilities while not physically being there. That's gonna be our primary focus today. I do talk on other topics and we have a slide coming up next if you are more interested in learning about teledentistry or SDF. I've got a couple of links that you can follow to be able to learn about those things. But today is about long-term care facilities. Another disclaimer is that I am not a scientist. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a professor. I am just a regular dentist. And I am just like everybody else watching this. I am learning as I go. Some of these concepts I'm going to present to you today are things that I have learned since the coronavirus to help take care of my patients. So there are things I'm going to talk to you about that I have very limited experience with. And I'm going to try to let you know those things as we go along so that you'll know my experience level with the different things that we're talking talking about. Here are some of the links and we'll provide those to you if you'd like of just um, some of my other courses on other topics. If you were hoping to hear a lot about teledentistry today, we're not going to talk a lot about that. But if you wanted to, here's the link. If you are wanting to hear a lot about SDF, you know, here here's some links for some SDF courses as well, if that's what you were, were looking for today. But today is about long-term care facilities. 
Another thing is questions. If we don't get to all of your questions, there are 841 people watching this right now. And if you all ask me a question, there's no way we'll get to that. So if we don't get to your question, do ask the questions. But if we don't get to your question, my email's right here. I'll put it right at the beginning so that you can have my email from the get-go and you can shoot me questions. I will do my best to answer all of those questions for you. I also like if you disagree with something that I'm talking about or you think that something's incorrect, please email me. I don't take any offense to that at all. We're all here to learn. And so if you see something that you think, oh, I'd like her to read this article and maybe she'd reconsider that, please send me that article because I do reconsider things if there's evidence to the contrary. So I don't consider that confrontational a bit. Please send me an email if you have any disagreements. Disclosures, I have no financial interest in any of the products that I'm talking about today. I will talk about specific products because I think it's helpful to learn about specific products, but I don't have any financial interest. Elevate has sponsored this, as you guys know, and I have been sponsored by Elevate a few times to do CEs. I've been sponsored by SDI and Mouthwatch has donated a couple of cameras to a pilot program that I'm doing in a long-term care facility. So I feel like it's fair to disclose all of the relationships, even if they have nothing to do with this lecture to you. I do want to give a good shout out to Elevate because they are a company that has sponsored me and has never asked me to change a single slide of my presentation. So I think that that's really cool of them that they just basically give you a green, green light to give your presentation. And so I think that that's really stand up that they do that. Some people care about affiliations. If you do, you can screenshot that or you're, I'm sure you'll be provided with the slides later. Um, my dental journey. I'm gonna just briefly go through so that you understand who I am and where I'm coming from. I did a hospital-based residency right out of dental school, and I did a five-week externship with the Underwood and Lee Clinic for adults who have special needs. I went to a private practice, and I worked in a private practice setting as an associate for a little under a year. It was pretty awesome, but my husband lived in Idaho, and I wanted to live in Idaho with him. So I moved to Idaho, and I started working at a federally qualified health center. They're an awesome health center. I really like them. They are well-run. They do a good job. They're an ethical health center, and I actually still work with them three days a week. I started my practice in 2016, which is a hospital-based practice because there wasn't anywhere for adults who had special needs to get care under general anesthesia. And with my practice in 2018, we expanded in two ways. We added medical professionals so that we could provide comprehensive medical and dental care under general anesthesia. Well, maybe not comprehensive medical care, but limited medical care, medical care and comprehensive dentistry under general anesthesia. And because I kept getting patients that have Alzheimer's and dementia referred to me, and their medical complexities made it so that general anesthesia for a lot of them was not an option. We had to think of some way to take care of these patients and that's what motivated me to start our mobile clinic because we know that behavior is influenced tremendously by our environment and we figured if we went into their environment where they feel comfortable then we could get some better behaviors. That actually has been successful. Um, it was myself and two assistants for the first year and then in 2019 we got a grant and with that grant it enabled us to hire our two expanded access hygienists to do hygiene services and teledentistry for us and we hired our regular oral hygiene assistant and she goes out three days a week and provides regular oral hygiene in one of our um, one of our nursing homes for a pilot program but I think we're going to be implementing that program in multiple homes coming next year because she's been very successful in 2020 the coronavirus hit which of course by the nature of my practice. Um, we're not practicing right now. We're not doing any elective surgeries. So we're, our hospital component is shut down. And we're going to talk a lot about risks and benefits in long-term care facilities and why we're not going to those either. So right now I'm just doing a lot of learning, a lot of teledentistry, a lot of communication, but no physical treatment in my practice. Looking at coronavirus, I think that there is a lot of changes we don't like with coronavirus. There's a lot of bad that's happened with coronavirus, but there are some good things that have happened as well. And I feel like the silver lining is that we're learning that we really didn't have the best disaster preparedness plans. At least in my office, we didn't have the best disaster preparedness plan. And this is teaching us the things that we need. And so I think coming out of this, we're gonna have a way better disaster preparedness plan. I think that we're gonna be way better at preventative for two reasons. One, we have to be. It's like the way we can manage disease right now. And two, we have time to look into some of these things with preventative. So I'm, I've had the opportunity to read more articles and to learn more about preventative. And I do feel like personally, I've gotten better and improved with that. And I feel like teledentistry is an asset to the practice if used correctly. And I feel like the coronavirus is going to bring out a lot more exposure to teledentistry. A lot more people are gonna try teledentistry. So I think those are our silver linings of coronavirus. One thing that seems to be a little bit controversial in some of the online communities that I participate with 
is why are we not quote unquote essential when it comes into the care facilities? And you'll see a lot of arguments come up on should we be there, should we not be there? And this article really speaks it to me. This article from the New York Times, it was talking about a home in New York that had 46 residents, 37 of them tested positive, 10 were hospitalized and two of them died. And this is the photo from that article, not from one of my facilities. And you know, you read those articles and it's in, in some big city where they've got this big outbreak, but it really hits hard when it hits in your community. And I had my first coronavirus death last week and it was a patient that I really enjoy. Every time we come in, he was happy to see us. He was smiling. He was a police officer for Halloween. He was a great, great guy and he died from the coronavirus. His symptoms, he was asymptomatic at first and all of a sudden he had a sudden onset I believe they told me that it was about three days after he started showing symptoms, he passed away in the hospital on a respirator. And so that that was actually really sad for me. And it really hit home as to the importance of keeping the coronavirus out of these group homes and out of these long-term care facilities. There are eight residents, it's a smaller facility, there are eight residents in that facility and they do not have their tests back yet or they haven't all been tested in that facility to see how many of those eight have coronavirus. His roommate was tested, his roommate was positive, his roommate's doing okay, but they do have another resident there that they're waiting for her test to come back. She is hospitalized um, and with symptoms of pneumonia. So, you know, it is something that can be a really big problem in these facilities. A lot of times people will say, well, some of those facilities aren't very clean. And this was a very clean facility. Every time I walked in there, it smelled like fabric softener. I mean, their facilities cleaner than my house. So I, I do want to emphasize that it is really important that we take this seriously in our long-term care facilities because it can happen. When we're looking at the asymptomatic spread, a lot of times people will say, well, yeah, I won't go into any of those facilities, even if I feel a little sick. But the important thing in these long-term care facilities is the asymptomatic spread. From the CDC, they say that the symptoms may appear two to 14 days after exposure and that some spread may be possible before people show symptoms. They also say that it is most contagious when people are symptomatic. And that's all from the CDC. But my interpretation of that is that they're most contagious when they're symptomatic because this is spread through respiratory droplets. So if you're coughing and you're spreading things out, it just makes sense to me that if you're not coughing and you're not spreading things out, of course, the main way is symptomatic. My question is, and I don't know if studies exist, I have not been able to find any if they do. My question is, is, is the virus itself any less virulent with the symptom while the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic? And that I don't know. Because in my idea, if you look at the bottom part here, you have this asymptomatic patient that you're treating that has coronavirus and doesn't know about it. Then we generate aerosols. They don't have to cough because we're generating these aerosols for them. We generate aerosols, then we expose ourselves and we become an asymptomatic coronavirus, you know, quote unquote patient because we're asymptomatic. Unknowingly, we could then bring it into a long-term care facility. And I don't know, now this bottom, the top part, that's from the CDC, that's all like very, peer-reviewed information, this bottom part, that is my interpretation as to why we have a higher risk in the long-term care facility. The CDC acknowledges that the asymptomatic spread is very prevalent in the nursing homes. And I've highlighted down here their sentence where it says, recent experience with outbreaks in nursing homes has reinforced that residents with COVID-19 frequently do not report symptoms such as fever and respiratory symptoms. Some may not report symptoms. Unrecognized asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic infections likely contribute to transmission in these and other healthcare settings. So they're saying that, you know, it is something to worry about in these long-term care facilities, this asymptomatic spread. The CDC is also guided in the healthcare facilities to cancel elective procedures and to use telemedicine when possible. And so this, when I was looking through the CDC's guidelines, this is from the long-term care facility section. If you're wondering where the section is, and you can click on the links below to get exactly to these documents here. But down here it says, because of the risk of unrecognized infection among residents, universal precaution, or Universal use of all recommended PPE should be standard for all residents in the facility if anyone in that facility has tested positive. So if you have an employee that's at high risk or you have a patient that's at high risk in the facility, everyone in that facility should be treated as if they have coronavirus if you are having to treat that patient. And that's just another testament to how the CDC like this asymptomatic spread is a problem in these long-term care facilities. And that's one of the reasons we are not in there right now. 
further exploring the CDC website, we looked at what are the nursing homes, how are they communicating this with the families of the residents? And I've got the letter pasted here on the right, and you can see the letter that the CDC has recommended sending out to the residents' families that say, we don't want any visitors. And it does say, and I've highlighted here, non-essential healthcare personnel and volunteers are now restricted from entering. And I don't like that sentence on there because I don't like the connotation that comes with non-essential, but I do wanna point out that it's in there. And then it also talks about canceling activities. So with that, my belief is that we are essential. My belief is that we are not a non-essential healthcare provider. And I like to really make that clear with the facilities and with the families that our services are essential. However, right now, the risks of us providing those services in those settings outweigh the benefits. The risks of us providing those services right now not forever, but right now the risks are outweighing the benefits. And so I like to make that real clear when I communicate with the families. And this is just a little chart to show that when assessing the risks and benefits of the whole, we're saying we go into these facilities and some facilities, every single person who lives there is our patient. But some facilities we go into, we only treat a subset of the patients. And we encourage that. If someone has a great relationship with their dentist, we do not want to break that up just because we happen to be there. So in our letters we send home when we get our initial patients, it says, if you have a dentist, then you're receiving treatment successfully. Don't consider us. So we do have a lot of patients in these facilities, well, a lot of residents in these facilities that are not our patients. And when we walk into the home and we risk the exposure of us being an asymptomatic carrier and bringing that into the home, we are increasing the risk for everybody, not just our patients. So we have to look at the group as a whole, risk versus benefits. And when I look at that for most of our facilities, is the benefit to the few worth the risk to the many? And that's just a question we need to ask ourselves as we're assessing if we should be going in. We also need to assess the individual risks and benefits for our patients. What is the likelihood that the disease they have is going to progress if we put this off for one month? What is the likelihood that it'll progress if we put it off for six months? And I think that that's probably the realistic estimate. And that's just my thought again, no evidence there that, just my thought. What is the risk if we put this off for a year? And I don't think it's gonna be a year before we're back in those facilities, but it could be. And so we wanna assess that risk on those different levels. You know, when we're looking at this month, is it going to be a big deal that we're not there this month? And for some things, yes, it will be. And for some things, no, it won't. So we have to assess every situation and every patient very differently. We also need to look how many visits is it going to take for us to successfully treat this problem that has been presented to us. So with a lot of the patients that I see, they have maladaptive behaviors. We have behaviors that prevent me from being successful the first time. And so with that, preventing me from being successful the first time, then if it takes more if it takes more visits, then there's more times where I'm going in and out of that building, more potential risk. So that has to be considered as well. We have to look at, are there any contact-free options to slow or to treat this condition that we would be going in to treat them for? So is there a way that I can take care of this to where we don't have to physically see them? And we're going to talk about some of those things throughout this presentation. But we, the next thing we have to look at is, what is the risk that you are going to expose them? How high risk are you to be an asymptomatic carrier? Are you regularly providing care at a practice where you may have people who are carriers come in? Or are you sitting home and only going out for an emergency call? You know, do you go to multiple different facilities where they have a lot of potential to have asymptomatic carriers? Or again, are you just sitting at home waiting for emergencies? So your risk of exposing them is going to be different you also have to consider what is the risk for them if they get the coronavirus? And it's not always the people that you think. The guy, my patient who passed away was in his 40s and his roommate was in his 70s. And so it's it's very different, you know, when you're when you're looking at that. And so you can't just say age being a variable. There's many different variables to look at when you look at someone's risk. And those variables are something that may warrant, you know, talking to one of our medical counterparts. I do a lot of medical consultations because I definitely do not know everything. And I like to get input from from various providers. And so talking to somebody's primary care physician, there's nothing wrong with talking to their physician. They may not know to assess the risk, but the two of you together may come up with a better idea than, than just what's in your own head. And, and I like to talk to primary care physicians a lot. 
So as we mentioned previously, there was a letter that probably went home to all of our long-term care facilities families that say, you know, non-essential healthcare providers. And so I want to send a letter, and this letter is going to go out next week to our families. And this is to, for multiple purposes. One, I want to tell the families that oral hygiene is still important. So one of the lines, and I've just highlighted some of the lines in the letter that if you draft a letter, you may want to consider using and feel free, use my lines if you'd like, it doesn't bug me a bit. I put in there, one thing coronavirus has not changed is the importance of oral health. And that is a true statement. Oral health is still very important. Then we put here, though our regular services are essential, and I like to use the word essential because that combats the idea of us being non-essential because I think we are essential. Though our regular services are essential, at this point in time, we believe the risks outweigh the benefits in most circumstances. Again, we were saying in most circumstances, because some circumstance may arise as we're evaluating these patients as individuals, as we're evaluating these facilities, as we're evaluating ourselves and all those individual risks and benefits for that comprehensive package of thought process, then we're going to want to say, you know, we believe the risks outweigh the benefits in most circumstances we will continue to evaluate and we will alert you if any changes as our body of information regarding the coronavirus continues to grow. And I like that statement that we put in there because it says one, we're essential, two, we're still looking at this, and three, there may be a situation where we do wanna see you in person and if that arises, then we're gonna be studying how to best do that. We also address in this letter how we're going to do prevention, how we're going to you know, establish a formal policy, which we have with most of our facilities. Some of our facilities, we don't have our formal policy, you know, in stone yet, but how we're going to establish a formal policy and coronavirus plan and how to address an emergency if one arises. The coronavirus preparedness plan is something that the CDC recommends for all of our long-term care facilities, and they recommend that this is done as a multidisciplinary team. And so, because they want a multidisciplinary team, us being on the team not only looks and feels good to us, it also looks and feels good to our facilities. And I would say don't wait for an invitation to be on this team because as a contractor or someone who's coming into the facility, the administrator's probably not gonna go to you to be on the team. They're gonna go to their staff and probably the MDs. The dentist is maybe not gonna be thought of, but that doesn't mean we're not important. And so this is just an example, a little cartoon that I drew of approaching these busy administrators. These administrators are people, these administrators are good people, and they're trying to do their best to take care of their residents during this time of pandemic. But they don't have time to spend with us to create a dental plan. We are the dental experts in those facilities, and we need to come up with our coronavirus action plan for dentistry and then present it to them so that they don't have to put a lot of thought into it. They don't have to put a lot of time into it. All they have to do is read through what we see, then put a lot of thought and say, yep, that sounds reasonable, or yep, that except for this part doesn't sound reasonable. And so I would challenge you guys, if you are coming up with these plans with your administrator and you're running into difficulties being able to do so, come up with the plan on your own with your team, of course, you know, edit the plan, make it look real nice, and then send it to the administrator for their approval. Because they've got so many things on their plate right now that making a dental plan is probably not the top of their priority list. But it is important that you have one. So I decided I would go through my plan with you guys so that you can um, read and use whatever you'd like out of my plan as you're generating your plans for your long-term care facilities. The first part of any plan, I like to have a statement of purpose in the plan. So our statement of purpose is, you know, to get through coronavirus, to improve oral health, and that we can use this in other situations where we're not going into the facilities for a period of time. You like to give credit to who makes the plan, but not only that, you want to see if anyone has any questions on these pl this plan, these are the people that you're going to go to. These are the people who are going to understand the purpose and the intent behind that plan. And it's important to include your team. You know, my myself, I go out there and I see the patients and I have a good base on their medical complexities. I've got a good base on what we can safely do. I've got a good base on the prevention side. But then we have our hygienist who goes out there more often and she's got a good base on what tools are specifically working for that patient. You know, what are the areas that they're missing? What areas do they have inflammation? So she's going to be involved in that plan as well. Our regular oral hygiene assistant, honestly, is the person who sees this patient three days a week. She's going to know that patient's limitations very well. And so I want all of those people to be part of this plan. I want to have the facility administrator be part of the plan, not in the generation of the plan because they don't have time for that, but in the approval of the plan. 
they're going to know what's, oh, there goes a little bit of coffee. Um, they're going to know what is going to be appropriate in their facility. They know their staffing. They know what's going to fly and what's not going to fly in their facility. And when people read that plan, if they see their boss's name on it, they're going to be more inclined to follow it. So just a little quick background, I talked a little bit about Savannah. Savannah is our daily oral hygiene assistant. We changed that term actually to regular oral hygiene assistant. And she goes out into the facilities, provides oral hygiene three days a week. You can see over here, if you can see my pointer, this is one of our packages. It has the patient's name. It has all of the different oral hygiene aids that we're using for them. And then she goes out, she does have gloves on, you just can't see. Um, and she goes and provides oral hygiene for those patients. Of course, she's not doing that right now. And so in our action plan, we, we consider her services valuable and so do our patients. So we wanna make sure that continues. So the first section of our action plan is going to be how we're going to continue this daily oral hygiene program. And with this program, we wanna specify a few things. And this is of course gonna be different for every single facility. It's going to be different for every practice. You know, you guys all have different things that you're going to be looking at and wanting to continue. But the important thing is you want to know what supplies do you need? Who's going to provide those supplies? And who are the people and what are those people going to do? So in our plan, we have, we're asking for a CNA to step up and be our oral hygiene leader. And Savannah is going to use teledentistry to help that CNA. And this has not is not in place yet. This is our plan. We have not taken action. I'm hoping to take action on this next week. But Savannah is then going to be live with that CNA and help with the daily oral hygiene for the patients that she's been assigned to for that pilot program. So teledentistry doesn't always just have to be the dentist diagnosing problems or looking for things. Teledentistry can be a support system that can be used for daily oral hygiene. So we will show you here, this just outlines, you know, the personnel, how we're gonna do training and the program specifics of what we're gonna do and feel free to read that at a later time. This, anytime you do a plan that involves stuff and people, you gotta say who's gonna pay for the stuff and who's gonna pay for the people because you don't want that to not be outlined. You never wanna have, you know, any disagreement based on something like that. And those are things where disagreements arise is who pays for stuff and who pays for people. So we outline that real clearly. And, for ours, we pay for most of the stuff. I've bought Chromebook computers, they're pretty cheap, they're like 200 bucks. And I bought the mouthwatch camera, again, pretty cheap, about 300 bucks. We have the Teledent program, we bought that since COVID. I was doing teledentistry that was um, asynchronous and it was a store and forward on an encrypted computer before coronavirus. Now, passing that computer back and forth and having to exchange that so many times poses an additional risk. We've decided to buy the Teledent software. Um, I've played with it a bit, I do like it. You can have that two-way video communication. And so that's something I don't have a ton of experience with, but we are learning with it and that's what we're gonna use. Um, so I have provided those things. The facility has to provide the appropriate PPE for their employee. And we've specified that that's what they're gonna, they're gonna provide. They also have to provide the disinfecting wipes and they have to provide the saran wrap. We're gonna use saran wrap to cover the computers because the computer will be less than six feet away from the patient. So at risk of having aerosol splatter and if we're going patient to patient, we don't wanna take that object from room to room you know, without it being properly covered. So we're gonna have them and we're gonna show them you know, through a video. I'm gonna have my computer, they're gonna have their computer. We're gonna practice wrapping the computer in saran wrap, which that's gonna be a lot of fun because we all know what it's like to use saran wrap. I'm terrible at it. Like, I'm bad at wrapping leftovers. We're going to see how well I wrap a computer. But there are people who are good at it. They're also good at wrapping leftovers. Um, we're going to provide the mouthwatch cameras, but we're going to provide the mouthwatch camera covers. But if they drop all of the mouthwatch camera covers in the sink, they will be charged for that. So if they run out, we have in there that if we run out in a reasonable amount of time, we will provide more. But if they run out through an error, then um, they will be providing that. And it's just little things like that that we like to put in those contracts so that we're just clear on what's gonna happen. I'm not gonna go through exactly the infection control that we're gonna take with this, but I have it lined out here. We do want them to not touch the computer or the saran wrap on the computer with dirty gloves because we just wanna minimize that spread. The saran wrap is over the computer because we wanna prevent any um, aerosols, we wanna prevent any droplets from getting on it. It's not so that you can touch that computer because saran wrap's gonna move around everywhere and it's not necessary to do so. So if you're gonna go back to the computer, we want you to put clean gloves. That's kind of the take home for that slide, but um, feel free to look at that slide later and read through what we're doing with that. Another thing we're doing with this re regular oral hygiene is we're going to ask that CNA to maybe once a week take a video of this person's teeth after you've performed the oral hygiene. And I'm gonna push play on this video here. 
there we go. And you can see here on this video, there are missing those posterior two teeth. And the CNA doesn't probably know that those teeth even exist. And again, you know, beginners, sometimes it's harder to see these videos, but a little Blair Witchy there, but I can still see that pretty good job except you're missing the back and so then we can provide them with input that says we need to get the back a little bit better and we can show them this video so they can see oh yeah i do need to get the back a little better i didn't even know those teeth existed and so teledentistry can help improve our oral hygiene which right now is what we can do to improve oral health in those long-term care facilities is oral hygiene So people say, well, we don't have this daily oral hygiene program in our long-term care facilities. So what do we do when we don't have this program to substitute? We don't have a savanna. And so if you don't have a savanna and you don't have that regular oral hygiene provider, and oops, forgot to change that to regular oral hygiene videos, but we can create, you can create your own videos and send the facility just little two minutes videos for those caregivers so that they can learn how to provide better daily oral hygiene. If you don't want to create your own videos, that is not a problem at all. We're working on creating videos and when we come up with a new video, we post it on our Facebook page. Feel free to check out our Facebook page. Um, our hygienists and our daily oral oral hygiene assistant, they've both put videos up there. So um, feel free to use ours. Those are totally free to use. Um, Dr. Paul Glassman came up with a whole series of training for people. And this is a great training. They're a little bit longer, but they have a lot of great information. And Sonia Dunbar, the geriatric tooth fairy, the length of hers is between um, Dr. Glassman's videos and our videos. Hers is a little longer than ours, but a little shorter than Paul's. And so those are all good resources. There's a lot of good resources out there and just encouraging those CNAs to watch those videos and to educate themselves on daily oral hygiene is going to make a tremendous difference in those patients. At the end of this presentation, I do have a video to show you just to show um, one of the training videos that we've made. Um, we're going to show you that at the end. It will play here and then I'll switch the slide just because you'll get sound if we do it at the end. If we do it now, you won't get sound. The next section of our action plan. So we're, we're still back on this action plan. The first action, first section we said, how are we gonna keep this daily oral hygiene going? The second section is gonna be, what are we gonna do for our patients of record? And we're gonna do individualized risk assessments for each of those patients. Like what do we think their risks are and are these risks increased due to the coronavirus? And what do we think that their best preventative plan will be? And just to give you, instead of explaining those, I'll give you a couple examples. And I apologize, I'm talking like 90 miles an hour because I've got like, I don't know, four hours of information to shove in this little um, time slot. And so I apologize if it's recorded, just like if it's real fast, just listen to it on slow. If you're a crazy person, listen to it on fast. But here's some examples of our risk assessments and our plans. This is a patient that I take to the operating room once every four years. We get minimal success when we try to clean his teeth, but we do try every six months. We try to get in there. We try to clean his teeth. We try to put fluoride varnish on just preventatively for him. But really, he's a low caries risk. I see him every four years in the OR. There is um, from the previous doctor who saw him in the OR. Um, he actually had to drive multiple hours away to get this done, but they did that for him. And he does have an OR history. And so he really doesn't have much like many fillings, not much dental work. So he is more of a low caries risk. At this point, there's really not much additional risk posed by the coronavirus and posed by him missing and cleaning through coronavirus. So our recommendations or our plan is to continue the regular regimen. And even though we don't have any changes, we still put the risk assessment in there and we still put the plan in there so that we acknowledge him as our patient. Very different situation here. Here we have a risk assessment. This is a patient that we've been seeing every six months. And every six months, we're putting silver diamine fluoride on a lesion that she has on her lower, what is it? It's her lower right. And we're putting this silver diamine fluoride every time. And we're trying to arrest that lesion, which we have arrested the lesion. It's totally arrested. Do we need to do it every six months? No, but we do it every six months because we do know with silver diamine fluoride that prognosis depends a lot on how isolated we're able to get everything and how dry we're able to get everything. And I will tell you that my patients are not always cooperative and we do not always have the best of isolation. So sometimes I like to go a little bit above and beyond the recommendation. And so I do like to apply it for her every six months just to make sure that doesn't progress. That cavity has not progressed. We've been managing it for about two or three years. She saw me in the, um, she's seen me both in the health center where I work and in my practice. And it's been great. However, this year she broke her leg and she missed her last cleaning and her last application of SDF. And now it's 
the coronavirus and people are not coming into the facility. So she's going to miss her next cleaning. So she is at higher risk for those caries to progress because she does have a lesion that we've been managing, that we've been looking at every six months. We've been reapplying a medicament. And I do feel like she has a little more increased risk there. So we have a plan for her. And our plan for her is using teledentistry. We're going to do two-way. We're going to do synchronous. And I am going to watch that CNA apply some povidone iodine as an antimicrobial for her in that area. The reason I've selected povidone iodide instead of silver diamine fluoride is because in my state, you cannot have the CNA apply silver diamine fluoride legally. If I could, I would have picked the silver diamine fluoride to do the teledental supervision and have them apply that silver diamine fluoride with the teledental supervision. But in my state, um, that is a procedure that's restricted to with an assistant direct supervision or with a hygienist that is restricted to general supervision. And so the application of silver diamine fluoride in this case with that teledentistry is, is not legal. So I went to what I thought was the next best thing as an antimicrobial and I went to the povidone iodine. Again, I would like to put varnish over the top for her, but in my state varnish is something that has the same same limitations for an assistant needs to be under um, direct supervision and with a hygienist under general supervision. So therefore I cannot have the CNA do that without my presence. Um, and that's just, but that's just for day one for her. So I'm gonna send that iodine over. We're gonna do that teledentistry. We're gonna have at least an antimicrobial and then I'm gonna have them put on the fluoride gel every day. So every other day of the month, they're going to brush floss and apply the 5,000 parts per million fluoride. We like, there's a lot of turnover. And so I don't know if they know that she likes quarters. Her sister's not there to be able to tell them that, that she likes quarters. And so we're gonna have them make sure that they wash the quarter and that they have that reward system in place for her to help increase her cooperation. And then we wanna make sure that they're especially careful with her diet and encouraging a non-karyogenic diet because she is at higher risk. So that's just an example of two different individualized risk assessment and plans for the coronavirus that can go to these facilities. We want to address emergencies if emergencies come up in these facilities. And for me, the easiest way to get a hold of me is to text me. I respond very well to texts. I check my voicemail like once a week. Um, I check my snail mail like never. And so, and email's pretty good too. But right now with coronavirus, we get so many emails every day that it's really hard to keep up on that. So I've informed the facilities that they, if they have an emergency, to text me. We'll set up a synchronous teledental interaction. We have a whole course on teledentistry, and if you want to learn more about teledentistry during COVID, I've learned a lot the hard way. If you want to learn the easy way by learning from my mistakes, um, let me know, and we can we can work out something for that. But you'll see over here that everyone's using the internet, so sometimes the internet can be slow, and that can be on your end or it can be on their end. But either way, live buffering kind of is not fun, and so I like to have them get a few photos, and I may, if it's a patient with behavioral troubles, and I'm worried about somebody getting bit, or I'm worried about, you know, someone getting hurt in the situation, I'll do a synchronous interaction where I'm watching them take my asynchronous photos. So they'll be taking pictures, and I'll watch them take pictures, but I am more synchronous for behavior management and asynchronous for being able to get a good photo that I can clearly see. There are going to be residents in the facilities that are not our patients and in our practice we said that we will help take care of emergencies for people who are not our patients but we do want to have a, if they have a regular dentist we want to have that regular dentist on our team and this policy outlines that you know we want to have their regular dentist be part of it we want to include their regular dentist in in this decision making because a lot of these people have seen this dentist for years and we don't want to change that relationship when we're bringing these things out, so we're going to bring out the computer, we're going to bring out the camera, and then some of the things we're going to talk about in a couple minutes, we're going to bring out some of these healthy choice options. When we bring this to the facilities, it's important that we deliver them in an appropriate way. So the way I would recommend is call the administrator and talk to the administrator about the best way to deliver things to their facility. Would they like you to drop it off and have a contact list, you know, like Domino's, the contact list delivery? Or do they want you to meet with a person and talk to that person and, and give that person the, the box? Do they want you to bring everything in bulk with instructions as to how to individually package these for the patients and then have their care staff package it? Or do they want you to package everything individually for the patients? So those are decisions that you and the caregiver can make depending on each individual situation. We also wanna look and describe to them the precautions that you took. And when we're looking and here are the studies below, you can see where we got the information. The virus apparently lives on cardboard for about 24 hours. And the thing that really stuck with me on that is 
where I put the gloves, like in an ordinary setting, the gloves are less than six feet away and the gloves have got cardboard. So I'm like, huh, 24 hours. That's interesting. And then the plastic, the study says that it can live on plastic for two to three days. So with some of the precautions and packaging, you know, like when this arrived, we did this, we did that, you know, we, we wiped this off, we did this and make sure to tell them not to wipe off the camera lens because it will damage it. So we'll get in a little bit and how to encourage them to make better choices. These are some of the biggest culprits I see in the long-term care facilities for caries. We've got our butterscotch candies, usually by the bed. We've got our peppermint candies, usually by the bed. We've got our sugary cough drops, which right now is something people are eating a lot of. And then chocolates, again, usually by the bed. And so I call these time release sugar capsules and people are putting them in their mouth because they have dry mouth, they're trying to go to sleep and they're sleeping with these things in their mouth or they're laying in bed watching TV. And this is the worst thing they can do for their teeth, but they're gonna do it because it's really hard to get them into these new habits. So what can we do instead of making a new habit is we can try to substitute the material that they're doing their habit with. So we're looking at xylitol. Xylitol and erythritol are both sugar alcohols and they're non-cariogenic. So they're not going to feed those bad bacteria. And this picture here is of me eating sprouts, which is healthy and gonna nourish my body and help me you know, sustain myself. And then we have me eating the plastic. I didn't really eat the plastic, don't worry. And then we have me eating the plastic that the sprouts came in. And that's not gonna nourish my body. So xylitol is like the plastic and that it's not gonna nourish those cariogenic bacteria. It's not going to lead to the acid formation and lead to those root caries. So if we can do a little sneaky switch of their butterscotch candies to a butterscotch xylitol candy, that's gonna be a lot better for that patient. If we can switch there, and it doesn't have to be a sneaky switch, we can just say, hey, try these two, which one do you like best? Okay, well, we'll keep do using these ones, or okay, we'll use these ones. Some of them are pretty good. Another thing that people actually like, it's a downside of xylitol, but in a nursing home, it's kind of an upside because people love laxatives in nursing homes. Um, if you tell them that xylitol can be a laxative, they will want to try this stuff. And so there's mixed reviews on the cariogenic prop or the anti-cariogenic properties of xylitol. And I've got some studies for you to look through. It looks like it was taken out as a preventative factor from the Cambro manual, but it's not to say that it's not a good substitute for sugar, regardless if you believe that it has um, anti-cariogenic properties or not. The good thing is it doesn't have cariogenic properties. So here's some articles for you to look up and read if you're interested in learning more about xylitol. And again, send me some more if you have some that are better than these. Here's just some examples. The Dr. John's sweets I've gotten online and I've eaten some of those candies and those chocolates are delicious. Um, the only downside I found with the hard candies is that sometimes with the hard candies, I don't know if it's a temperature sensitive or a time sensitive thing, but I've had some that were on the bottom of my candy dish and over time it kind of melted and then re-solidified and it, and it was sharp on the edges. So you'll wanna be careful if you're keeping those by someone's bed, you'll wanna make sure that at the, the bottom of the barrel, you don't have any that have little sharp edges on them. Um, and that, I don't know if that's something that happens normally or if it's just something that happened in my candy drawer, but that's just something to look out for. The ice chips, those are actually the texture people seem to like, and they are delicious as well. There's so many different flavors, so it's easier to find a flavor that they probably will like. In Japan, this on the left here, this picture over here, this is actually in Japan as we're going up to the gas station and we're looking down at all of the options. And it's just interesting to note that in some company or some companies, in some countries, xylitol is what flavors gum. And so if you look at all their gum, it's very hard to find something that is not a xylitol product in some of these stores. And so it's very common outside of the US. It's a little less common in the US, but I think it's gonna gain some popularity as people decide that they that they like the xylitol products. And when you're looking at over the counter, well, I guess it's all over the counter, but if you're looking at where you're obtaining the xylitol from, usually xylitol that's professionally distributed, those products usually have more xylitol in it than say the ones that you're gonna buy, like the ice cubes that you would buy at the supermarket. But it's important to note that all of them are sugar-free. All of them are gonna help stimulate saliva. And so we want whatever is the easiest for those patients to be able to obtain, whether it's you giving it them or if they're picking it up at the grocery store or a combination of both, that's so much better than having them have their little sugary time-release sugar capsules. Cough drops. Cough drops, I say cough drops are candy for sick people because the, if you look at the ingredients of cough drops, it's pretty much candy and then you add like, I don't know, eucalyptus or menthol or something with a candy and then call it a cough drop. 
it, you'll really want to look into the sugar-free versions of cough drops. But the downside is that a lot of our, you know, sugar alcohols are going to have a laxative effect. And the last thing that you want is a cough and diarrhea. So you're going to want to take these sparingly and don't chew them, of course, and swallow them. So these are just I like the ones that have lasting effects, you know, with the menthol and the eucalyptus and things like that added because they do kind of soothe a little bit longer and make you need less of them. So, you know, less need for the um, laxative effect or less laxative effect. But sugar-free cough drops is a huge thing that we try to propose to some of our facilities and some of our patients. And those are definitely going in our care packages, sugar-free cough drops. There's talk of licorice root extract being anti-cariogenic. The studies, there's mixed reviews on that. There's not a whole lot of studies that, that show that being effective. There's not a whole lot of studies that show it not being effective. So I can't say that there's a lot of peer-reviewed evidence for it. Um, there are a little bit of downsides. When I was researching through the licorice root, it can affect um, your potassium levels. And so that's something to look at for the patients if you're eating a lot of it. If they're eating it as directed or they're using it, you know, having two suckers and not chewing them, well, chewing them doesn't affect anything other than just the time it's exposed. You want it to be in there to be exposed for longer. But um, if you're using them twice a day for 10 days, you're not going to get a lot of problems with that, or you're not going to get problems with it with the downsides because you're not having a bunch of it. You can see the maximum dose here. But the important thing with these is that they are way better than sugary candy. And so if you try these, and you think they're delicious and you think your patients might like them, go for 10 days with a special treat. It's not gonna hurt. If you try the lemon one, by the way, it's very gross. There's a reason the lemon one's not being sold anymore. It is being sold like discount on Amazon. So if you try the lemon one, you say, oh no, that, those things are gross. That is, and no offense to lemon, but the lemon one I do personally think is gross. I am excited to try these other ones. I have not been able to try the other ones yet, but I'm excited to try them because I've heard rumors that these ones actually are pretty good. And so having a variety and finding something that your patient likes as an alternative to sugar is great. And this is another option for that. And this is something I don't have a lot of experience with, is with, with these, this particular product. I'm going to be trying it soon, um, and we will see what we think of it. But it is an alternative to sugar, and that's going to be something that will help them. Here's some studies to read if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Arginine bicarbonate, and so that's what's in the basic bites. And I don't know if you've tried those or not. I've never tried the caramel ones. I want to, because the chocolate ones are very delicious, and they're the idea behind them is that the good bacteria will eat the arginine and raise the pH through their metabolic process. And the bicarbonate acts as a buffer itself. And then it has calcium in it, which is something that will help re with remineralization. So that's the idea behind it. Whether it works or not, there is significant bias potential in the studies that have been run, you know, specifically with this. And there's mixed results on arginine studies that I was able to find. But Again, they're delicious and they are, I don't think that there's a whole bunch of mixed results if it's better for your teeth than candy and it tastes like candy. And so I do think just with the theory behind it, I think that there's something to that. I also think that there's something to the licorice root. I just don't think that we have the peer reviewed evidence for it to say that there's something to it. I think that there's potential for it. And if it's not going to hurt and it has potential to help, like I like to try these new things to see because sometimes in our patient population, we have to try a lot of things to get compliance. But if you haven't tried the basic bites yet, you want to soften them in your mouth first if the patient has crowns, because if that crown is loose, you know, if that crown's going to come off, it's a problem and we want it to come off so we can fix it anyway, right? But right now we don't want that to happen. We don't want a crown to come off during the coronavirus pandemic that we're going to have to decide, you know, risk versus benefits of re-cementing that crown. So you will want to have them soften this in their mouth first and then chew them. But gosh, I mean, like I bought some for myself and I've been eating them every day. They're, they're really good. I'm kind of a fat kid. You can't see me from like here down, but but kind of a fat kid and I like to eat chocolate. So that's that's kind of helped me not eat as much chocolate. And so we are at 47 minutes right now. So what I think we'll do is we'll take some questions and then we'll jump into because those people that do have to leave on the hour, we'll let we'll take some questions so that your questions can be answered. And then after those questions are over, we'll jump back into aggressive preventative 
preventative topical medicaments, um, denture cleaning, and things of that nature afterwards. Because we just had a lot of material in a short amount of time to disseminate that information. I feel like here is a good stopping point for those people who want to jump off. This is being recorded. So if you have to jump off and you want to hear the rest of it, you know, Elevate will have this up for their webinars. And so does, does that sound good to, to you as well? That's a, that's a great idea, Dr. Fukioka. So we'll take a quick break here um, for some questions. I'll just do a couple, again, just little housekeeping notes here to remind everyone if anyone does need to jump off here at the hour mark. Um, so your CE credit will be automatically emailed out to you within about two hours after the presentation today. And again, just be sure to check your spam folder if you don't see it right away. And then also keep up with us through our Facebook and Instagram so you guys can see any upcoming presentations we have. And then the website that we had on that beginning slide, it's www.elevateoralcare.com slash elevating care. And that's where you can find uh, Dr. Fukioka's presentation will be recorded and uploaded there in about a week or so, as well as all of the other uh, continuing education programs we've had to this point and any future ones that we have as well. All right, so we're gonna jump into a couple questions here. All right, so all of these items that you recommend for their continued oral health, like xylitol, dry mouth spray, prescription toothpaste rinses, are these being covered by the long-term care insurance or is this out of pocket? That is an excellent question and that's going to depend. There, for me, we actually have a really good situation right now and we have a HRSA grant to help with our program. So we are paying, for these products through the grant. Not everybody has a grant. In fact, most people don't have a grant. And so this would be something that you would have to negotiate and probably negotiate in that agreement as to who's gonna pay for these products. I would say at this point, offering them at cost would probably be a nice thing, but then you are using your time and not getting reimbursed for your time. Depending on the product, if you're, we haven't talked about the, um, aggressive topical medicaments and things like 5,000 parts per million um, fluoride gel and fluoride pastes, but there are some states where the Medicaid program will pay for some of these topical medicaments. So you wanna check into your state, see if their Medicaid will pay for it. In my state, they, they do not, and I'm not knowledgeable in other states. Um, in some states, they will pay for, like health savings accounts will help pay for things. I don't know, not an expert on that at all. And in my state, I've not had any success getting these to be paid for by anyone except for the patient themselves. I do have patients who do buy some of these things their families buy some of these things before we got the grant and we were just recommending some of this stuff I have had patients that buy it we right now are giving samples to everybody with websites so that if they want to purchase more they can purchase more so we are distributing samples and samples meaning like I don't know like a week's worth to see if they like it and if they like it because it's not cheap it's not expensive but it's not cheap and especially when you're treating you know I mean we have hundreds of patients that we're trying to give these to we can't afford to provide everybody all their stuff even with a grant and so we're utilizing our grant to give them a sample with the website with all the information educating them as to why it's important to switch and then hoping that they make that switch over and we're going to follow up with them and see did you like it if so are you planning on getting more and if not why and then try to try to address those problems on a more individual basis so i'm sorry that didn't answer your question very well but that was the best of my ability to answer it that's great. Um, and then a couple other people have been typing in asking about slides um, and access to your slides. So is that possible? Um, let us know and we will communicate that link to all attendees afterwards through email. Yeah, if, uh, if you guys can post them, I'm willing to give them. Um, I, I don't mind giving them at all. I don't want to send out 900 emails with my slides like that. I probably won't do. But if there's a way, is there a way that you guys, I can give them to you and you guys can post them or... If, if there's a mass email with a link that you could send to them, is there a way to do that on a on a bigger level? Yeah, we should be able to, if you give us access to them, we should be able to get them to them. So yeah, that will be no problem. Perfect. I'm super happy to do that. And if there's a way to give you access to my agreements, I can eliminate all the patient information off my agreements and give you that as a template if you want, if you want those too. I'm totally, totally happy to share whatever I got. All right, great, thank you. And I'm sure everybody appreciates that. Okay, so let's see here, a couple more questions. Um, again, some on billing here, but do you bill or how are you reimbursed for daily oral hygiene visits? So our daily oral hygiene visits right now are being covered by the grant, but the grant's not gonna last forever and Savannah will because those services are 
awesome. What we're providing for them has improved the oral hygiene more than anything else I've been able to do. And that's just, I mean, that's not peer reviewed study or anything. That's just my personal experience. When I went into the facilities, I thought, man, I'm doing a great thing providing all this mobile care to these patients until I hired the hygienist. And then when I hired the hygienist, I'm like, well, dang, what they're doing is, you know, is helping even more than what I was doing. And that's awesome. And then we hired Savannah for this daily oral hygiene. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is helping even more than what we're doing because it's daily and it's regular. And so the value that is there does exist. And what we've been doing, and we've done some surveys with the patients as well, you know, as far as sustainability, because anytime that you're doing something with a grant, the most important thing to do is, is this sustainable after this funding is gone, right? We don't want to waste money by doing stuff that only works while the money's there. We want to make sure that we can sustain it. And so, on the surveys that we've gotten back from patients, a lot of the families are willing to pay for this service. It is not something that's covered. Um, there are some people who know how to work Medicaid in a way where things can be like, a, I think it's called an incurred medical expense. I've yet to educate myself in that. I want to educate myself in that. That might be some, that might be an avenue to look down as something called an incurred medical expense, but I need to learn more about that before I you know, tell anybody about it or before I do it myself. But we do have um, people who are willing to pay for the service. Right now, nobody is because the grant is covering her wages. And we have figured out that if we if we have a hygienist doing this, it's going to be more expensive. But if we have a hygiene student or we have an assistant that's providing this daily oral hygiene and they're trained, you know, and they're doing that, it cuts the cost down significantly. And I believe that it's it cuts it down to less. It's less than $100 a month to have her do that. I wish I had the math on me right now, but it's been a couple, let's see, she's been out there for about a year. So when I initially did the math was like a year and a half ago and my brain barely remembers my husband's phone number. So I, I don't remember numbers well at all, but it is, it is definitely affordable for the families to do that. Um, we figure that she's with each patient for about 15 minutes and every state has different minimum wages and different wages. We pay an average of 10 to $12 an hour because we pay per patient, not per hour. And so if she spends about 15 minutes with every patient, then it works out to not costing too much per day. All right. So, so I hope that answered sure. there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, another question here is, is um, specific to 5,000 parts per million toothpaste, and it says that 5,000 parts per million from a pharmacy is expensive and small tubes don't last long. Do you guys have a solution for that? Is selling directly a solution? Um, so I'm going to answer that question in the next section, but I'm also going to answer it right now for in case the person who asked that question has to leave. There are a lot of factors that go into choosing your 5,000 parts per million. In fact, you all can see my slides right now, right? Yes, we can. Can you all see my slides? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to jump to that part of the presentation and answer that question with the presentation. That way we're not redundant. So when I talk about fluoride, I talk about in a long-term care facility, you need a script or you need a doctor's order. Because if you have a script or a doctor's order, then it goes into their medical record and it's something that has to be done daily. That, that's the rules in a long-term care facility. And so if I don't write a script on a script pad, I will write a doctor's order in their little doctor's order book. And I have two scripts. You can see them both here. Um, I typically favor using 5,000 parts per million as a lotion instead of as a toothpaste. I like to rub it on and like brush, floss, rinse, then rub your lotion on and go to bed. Cause I like to rinse after I brush. That's just like, personally, I like that. I found patients like that as well. And when you use it as a lotion, I found higher compliance. But there are also patients who have less compliance with that and they would rather use it as a toothpaste. So of course we have different directions for that where we have them floss, rinse, and then use this. But then this next slide is which fluoride product to choose. And with our patients um, in a long-term care facility with Alzheimer's and dementia, with our patients in um, a group home when they have autism and different things, textures matter. And so do we want gel versus do we want paste? There, that's going to be different. It's going to be different for different patients. Do you, gels really aren't like as nice when you're using them to brush, but they are way better when you're using them for a lotion. When you're using it for paste, some of the pastes have a weird texture. I don't know if you ever tried some of the generic um, 5,000 parts per million pastes, but I have. And um, I found that some of them are really smurf blue and they dissolve real fast and they're really gritty. And I'm not saying that, that all of them are, and I'm not saying that this one on here is, but I'm saying that I have tried some that are. And so you'll want to go to the pharmacy and you'll want to try those different gels and pastes that you're prescribing for your patients so that you understand how hard or how easy it is going to be to comply with your recommendations. Um, we have 
we do can and will and do distribute some ourselves so they don't have to go to the pharmacy and so that it'll be less expensive for those fee-for-service patients um, one thing i really like about the just right which is the the elevate product for the 5,000 parts per million is that it's dosed. And so when you're having somebody and you're writing the script and you want them to apply this to their teeth nightly, you know, they can actually get a dose by just doing the like pump for your dose. One, another thing I like about that is we have patients who really like to put a lot of toothpaste on their brush and that gets real expensive. If someone's renewing their prescription at the end of the month, you're like, whoa, you're using too much. Um, and so I've seen patients that take the toothpaste and squeeze just like a ton of toothpaste on their toothbrush. And so for those patients, it's like, well, actually, I think you need to use this and you use one pump and they're like, oh, that's way less. So we like that. Um, Obtainability is a big thing and it's different in different states. So you're going to want to look at your state and say, will your state reimburse you to distribute this? And a lot of the patients I work with are Medicaid. So that is a, a big decision factor for me. In my state, I'm not reimbursed for distributing 5,000 parts per million. And so Medicaid won't pay me to distribute it. And so that is a barrier for my Medicaid patients. Because even if I only charge like 12 or $13 for it, my Medicaid patients sometimes won't or can't pay for that. And so I've got to prescribe them something where they can go to a pharmacy and then their Medicaid will cover it. But the fee-for-service patients, it can be cheaper to distribute it from your office and you can charge them a cheaper fee. So in answer to your question, that was a long-winded answer for, to your question, but I felt like it would be best to just jump right into this slide for it so that we don't you know, be redundant for those people who are staying on. Um, I feel like different situations call for different fluorides. And with the coronavirus, you know, you've got to consider going into the pharmacy. Is that another risk for this higher risk patient being in public? Is someone going to go get that for them? Are there drugs delivered? And a lot of the long-term care facilities, the pharmacies actually deliver. And that's that's been the protocol for a while. And most of the facilities that I go to, their drugs are delivered. So we're not worried as much about the delivery. But if you're in like a private practice setting and you've got this patient that's in your office, you know, or you're in a setting where this patient is living at home, do you want them to run to the pharmacy now, you know, with all of the other people running to the pharmacy to go pick up their fluoride, or would you like to just give it to them in the office? So there's definitely benefits on both. Um, as far as a solution to the problem that you presented in this question is if you're, you definitely, there are multiple products you can distribute out of your office. And I like having lots of options for patients. In fact, we talk about flavors being one of the factors. And these are over the counter flavors that we have. And they're, all of them have fluoride in it. We make sure that it has fluoride. There are Toms that don't have fluoride. So we tell people, if you're going to buy Toms, make sure you buy the Toms with fluoride. If you're going to buy the Tasty Paste, make sure you buy the Tasty Paste with fluoride. Um, MI Paste has a whole bunch of different flavors in it because there's all these barriers to using that toothpaste. And you want to make sure that you can break down whatever the specific barrier is for that patient, be it taste, be it texture, be it cost. But you also have to do your homework with it, too, because not all the cool tastes, which some of these look fabulous, um, but not all the cool tastes have fluoride. And as much as I hate to admit it, whiskey toothpaste doesn't have fluoride in it. So, but it does have actually, what was it? Six proof whiskey in it. I think this is, I don't think this exists anymore, but I just was really excited that that, that was a thing because I did my dental school in Kentucky. There's bourbon toothpaste too. But the bacon, the pickle, and the cupcake, those are all just flavored paste. They're, they're not fluoride toothpaste. So you want to make sure that the patient looks to make sure there's fluoride in it if you're trying to use that toothpaste to get fluoride. You want to make sure that it's affordable for that patient. And affordability is based on that individual. So you want to have a diverse offering of options for them. You want to be able to offer it in your office for those patients that it's more expensive at the pharmacy. But you also don't want to be adverse to writing the script for that patient whose Medicaid will only cover it at the pharmacy. So that was a really long answer to your question, and I apologize for the long answer, but I thought it just went right into that. That was great, because it actually answered a couple other questions in there that had come in, so that was perfect. Okay. All right, another question here um, is asking about electric toothbrushes and aerosols, and what's your opinion on that? You know, that is an awesome question, and I don't have a good opinion on that, and that's something I should research more. Um, and I apologize for not having that. I am gonna write that down, because one of the concerns that I have right off the bat with mentioning that, and it's just something that never crossed my mind before. So whoever thought of that question, thank you for being brilliant and thinking of that because I did not. Um, what crosses my mind with it automatically is that a lot of our residents are in these long-term care facilities have roommates, you know, and their roommates sharing the bathroom with them. And so regardless, electric toothbrush versus a regular toothbrush, we are going to be creating some of these aerosols. And so do we need to think of different practices and different cleaning techniques when utilizing this shared bathroom amongst 
two people in a long-term care facility? That's an excellent question, and I will work to have the answer on it. And when I find out what the answer is, I will let Elevate know so that they can post, if they're willing or want to do that, um, I will try to see if we can post that after the presentation, because that's a great question that I don't have a good answer for. Absolutely, thanks. All right, and then the last question here, and then we'll let you continue on with your presentation, was in regards to pre-rinses um, prior to you guys doing your essential treatments to patients. So I've read a lot of things on the pre-rinses, and I was actually reading some this morning on pre-rinses. The ADA's recommendation was, I believe, the dilute hydrogen peroxide solution. There's also been some talk with the chlorhexidine rinse. What I've read in the study so far is that specifically to looking at the coronavirus, that it seems that the hydrogen peroxide is more um, effective. And I, you know, I like to do pre-rinses sometimes before even the pre-rinses were cool, depending on what the patients were, you know, depending on the patient's situation. In any patient that has a higher risk of infection, whenever I do um, extractions, for example, when you have those patients that come in and you have to do some extractions on a mouth that is just bacteria ridden, I would always have them rinse for a minute with chlorhexidine before, and that's just something we've always done. Chlorhexidine is usually my go-to rinse, but in reading some of these coronavirus studies, it with specifically that virus, um, the hydrogen peroxide looks to be, and again, this is just me as a dentist reading the things that I'm finding, um, it looks to be that the hydrogen peroxide is more effective against that specific pathogen. And as to why, I don't know. Um, someone tried to explain it to me and I was not smart enough to get it, but um, I, I do see a value in pre-rinses. Um, that wasn't something we did on regular patients, but it is something that I had done bef beforehand on patients that I thought would be at risk for infection. And it is something that that I am going to do if we have an emergency patient. I, I would probably consider the hydrogen peroxide because right now the risk of the coronavirus is the bigger risk. But then I will have to look more into the different pre-rinse regimens before we would decide, you know, in the future what would be the best. So excellent question, and I hope I answered it sufficiently. But um, not an expert in that area. I think you did great. Okay, so those are um, the questions for now. So if you want to continue on with your presentation and then everyone will, again, be emailed their CE certificate in about two hours, but uh, please stay on and listen in for the remainder of the presentation. And, and it doesn't hurt my feelings at all. If you have something else you have to do, it doesn't hurt my feelings at all. If you just, there's something else you want to do. I mean, if, if Tiger King is on or something, go for it. You know, you can do the multitasking too. Um, but we'll just go through a few of the topical medicaments that um, either I'm using or that I am deciding that I may consider using during this situation. We've talked about fluoride already, you know, and we all understand the hydroxyapatite and fluoroapatite and how with the fluoride, you're going to change that critical pH so it's less likely for the acid to dissolve the tooth. And that's that's the awesome thing about fluoride. And most of us know that, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. We've already talked about the different scripts, talked about the different products, talked about, you know, taste. And taste is taste is huge. You know, for some of our patients, I really I have the bacon toothpaste and the pickle toothpaste, and I I'm really tempted to taste them, even though they don't have fluoride. I just want to see how close. I also have wasabi, wasabi toothpaste. Like, I really want to taste it. It expired two years ago. But another thing that with the coronavirus looking at is silver diamine fluoride. One of my goals, and I've presented this to our board of dentistry, and we're contemplating how to make this a possibility. Um, they have shown some idea of support, but it has not been passed. So I don't know if they support it or not. But I have proposed to allow us to use synchronous teledental supervision to have a caregiver or a patient apply silver diamine fluoride after you have had an exam with that patient and you are currently having synchronous a synchronous encounter with that patient so you're currently you know watching them apply it there are risks of course with that with anything there are risks with it and the biggest risk with having a patient or an untrained person apply sdf is the risk to the eyes if you get sdf in the eyes because it is has a basic ph i learned this actually while i was looking into sdf is that basic ph is like chemicals with a basic ph will cause more damage to your eye than with an acidic ph and so and it's just the nature of how it interacts with your eye tissue apparently and again not an ophthalmologist just read a couple of things on damage to the eye but 
with the SDF, I think that it would be great in a lot of situations to be able to do that. That is likely not legal in your state. I'm not recommending you do that, but it is something that we are looking into. And at the end of this, I do have a video of me doing a terrible job. So people say, well, what if you do, what if the patients, they don't know what they're doing, but if they do a really bad job, they're going to burn the tissues. And I will show you myself burning my tissues at the end as to what, what the risks are. So you can properly assess risk for benefit for the patient. If you think they're going to get it in their eye, don't do it. I mean, don't do it anyway, because it's not legal. But if it does become legal and you think and you don't trust that they won't get it in their eye, then they're not the patient for that. But that's one of the uses that I think silver diamine fluoride can play with coronavirus is arresting caries and treating caries while we're not physically present. But even though that that's not something we can do, it still plays a role with emergency treatment. If I've got a patient that comes in and needs an emergency extraction and they've got rampant caries everywhere else, there's no reason not to try and arrest all those caries while they're in the chairs. SDF doesn't create aerosols. When you use your air water syringe to dry it off, it can create some aerosols. And so if that's something you're worried about, which I'm kind of like, you know, I would say that I'm more picky, so I would probably be worried about it. But um, I would take my two by two and a micro brush and you can, you can get it relatively dry and you can treat those surfaces with the SDF without creating any additional aerosols during that emergency visit. So why not prevent future emergencies if you can while they're sitting in your chair? The risk has already happened, right? You've already done this extraction. They've already come into the office. You guys have already interacted. So might as well get all of those other lesions arrested with the SDF. This is not a course on SDF, but just for those people who are not as familiar with SDF, there are a lot of really good courses out there on SDF. I'm sure Elevate can point you to a bunch of courses that are great on SDF. I have a couple courses on SDF out there, but just for the basics, you've got to share fluoride, doing what fluoride does best, forming the fluoroapatite. And then the silver, it binds with the thiol amino acids and nucleic acids to form silver amino acids and silver nucleic acids. And the purpose of that, if you think about proteins and all the way back to biochem, you probably remember with proteins that the structure of the protein helps determine the function. And if the structure is incorrect, it cannot function. You also probably remember that proteins are super important for life. So if you don't have you know, properly structured and functioning proteins, that is not good for life. And so up here, oh, I should have asked if my pointer works, but if my pointer works, then you can see me pointing over here. If not, then I apologize. I'm just pointing at nothing. But you can see this cysteine residue right here in the protein. So this is your amino acid right here. And you wanna form this disulfide bond with this amino acid over here. And you can see this reaction down here where you have the disulfide bond forming, right? So you have this guy and this guy, they form a disulfide bond and that affects the structure of the protein. And I remember, I didn't remember at all until I started looking at SDF, what disulfide bonds were, except for I remembered that they were very important in protein structure. And that's all you really need to know is that they're important for protein structure. When silver comes in, it bonds here. You can't form that disulfide bond. And now the protein's not going to have the right structure. So it's not going to have the right function. And so that is bad for the life of the bacteria. And I like to illustrate that with video games. You've got this guy wanting to form a disulfide bond with this guy, and they do, and then they have this happy gaming evening until this guy sees this that he wants to form a bond with, and he's a little more interested in this than he is in this, so they form their little bond over here, and that poor sad guy, this disulfide bond didn't happen. It affected the structure and the function of this, which in our terms is the bacteria, and the bacteria does not either, it doesn't survive or it deactivates. So. That's just my little analogy for how SDF works. I like to try to understand in my mind how things work. Even if I don't totally understand them, I like to try to understand a bit. And that's that's how I like to think of SDF. The uh, next question is, does it work? And this is one of, my, there's a ton of studies on SDF to show that it works. And I've got some of them listed after here. But I like this one because I really like the pictures. I think they're pretty. You've got your negative control with no bacteria here. You've got your control with bacteria here, and you've got your control that's been treated with the SDF here. Red is dead bacteria, green is live bacteria. And to me, that picture just makes it clear that yes, SDF can kill bacteria. The other question is, does it kill all bacteria? And no, no, it doesn't kill all bacteria. And that was something that when it came out, um, Gordon Rella Christensen in their clinician's report came out with something that said, hey, well, we're cultivating bacteria under these treated lesions. And I think that the response to that that I liked the best was Jeremy Horst. And I keep his quote up here in almost every presentation I do because I like the way he says that just because you can cultivate bacteria from something doesn't mean that those bacteria are active in causing caries. And I had to look up what 
I don't even know how to pronounce this word, like quiescent, whatever that word is, it means dormant. And so I like to look at things and see, one, does it make sense biochemically to me? And two, are there studies that support it? And I think with silver diamine fluoride, for me personally, yes, that makes sense to me biochemically. And yes, I found enough studies for it to say that, yes, I, I do think that there's enough evidence out there to say that it's working. If you want to have more information on SDF, here's a bunch of resources for you. And again, these slides will be given to you so that you can have them and, and click on some of those links if you want to learn. This is a big book. It's on silver diamine fluoride and glass ionomer restorations. It's a long book and don't let that intimidate you. There are a lot of stories in that book. There's a lot of different things in that book so that you can use their table of contents and you can read what you find is applicable to you. It's not like you buy that book and have to read that entire book to get the meat and potatoes of it. Like you can read what you wanna read in there. So I recommend that book. I, I learned a lot from that. Here's some sources, sources. The next topical medicament we talked a little bit about before is povidone iodine. I put the composition of the povidone iodine up here because there's a lot of different formulations of iodine and all the studies that I read that have to do with dentistry is this povidone iodine and it's 1% iodine, 8.5% whatever this is, this PVP and 90% water. So as I'm looking at iodine products, I'm wanting to make sure that it actually is the same thing that, it, that is in these dental studies because there are some that have other chemicals in it and I don't know how that reacts. Again, because I'm not a biochemist and I am not an expert on this. I want to make sure that what I've read in the studies is what I get and that's why I put that on there. There, I looked at the mechanism of action and it does seem to make sense that it would damage proteins in the cytoplasm. It damages bacterial cell membranes and it interferes with biofilm formation on the tooth. And that's like, if you remember back to like the glucosamyl transferase and the fructosamyl transferase and how those are involved in the process of forming that pellicle, you know, this is disrupting that. And so that's what we're looking at with the iodine. When we're looking at the iodine, there are a lot of people that have thyroid problems and I don't use it in any patients or wouldn't consider using it in any patients that have a thyroid problem. And that's mostly due to my lack of education with the povidone iodine and with the thyroid problem. I feel like before I used it in somebody that had that, I would need to educate myself more. Um, of course, iodine sensitivity, just like any drug, they always put that as a precaution is if you're allergic to the drug, don't use the drug. If you're using, allergic to the antiseptic, don't use the antiseptic, like that makes sense. But um, there's a lot of different ways to deliver it. Right now, what I have for some of my higher risk patients are these prep pads. They're easy to send, but I'm looking into these because I think this will be easier to apply. I've done it on myself. You can see here, these are my teeth. And so I use the prep pad on my teeth. It makes them yellow, but that yellow does go away. And in the studies that I read, they put the povidone iodine on and then they put the varnish over the top. Now in my state, again, the varnish is not something that we can do, but um, you could still do the povidone iodine. There's nothing that says that they can't do the povidone iodine in our state. And so when we look at effectiveness, there've been some small group studies in children. And there's one study that was, I can't find the publication for the study, but I found like the submission for the study to be done. And then I found some of the notes from the, I believe it was either the IDARE or the AAC conference where they had an unpublished trial of the povidone iodine working well in root caries for geriatric patients. So I've not found as much information on this as I found on SDF. I'm much more comfortable with SDF, but this is another alternative in situations where SDF can't be an option. And who knows, maybe it has a lot of potential that I'm just not aware of yet. So there's the references there. I like using aminocycline gel in some of our periodontal patients. And the Arrestin product is aminocycline powder, you know, that you can put in the sulcus for patients. But what I like to do in some of the patients that have a pocket that's not going to resolve or have like chronic perioabscess, one of the periodontists that I very much respect that works in our area that I refer to quite a bit, he taught me to mix some minocycline with some sterile lubricant and apply that. And I've done that a few times, just a select few patients. It's not something I do regularly, but I've seen great results in clinic doing that. There is a product in Europe that's called dentomycin. It's not available in the United States, but it actually is a minocycline gel. And during COVID, we had a patient that had 
an abscess and she has this recurrent abscess and we have put this on her recurrent abscess as well. She's in a long-term care facility and we can't go in to see this patient, but she has this abscess on this canine implant that she's had for long before I knew her, long before the periodontist knew her. And we're like, what can we do to help with that? She regularly does use a chlorhexidine and that wasn't helping. And so what we did was, was we had the pharmacy because I, I obviously can't compound it, I'm not there. And so we had the pharmacy compound a 2% minocycline gel and they're topically applying it. Is it awesome? Is it peer reviewed? Not really. Did it help her? It did. It, it helped with her abscess. And so and we can use teledentistry to monitor that. And so you can use some of these, minocycline can be topical because it's, I looked up here, but it's lipid soluble. So it can penetrate and it can work locally. And then it works, of course, systemically as well. With some of our patients in these long-term care facilities, you know, systemic antibiotics, they, they have their risks as well. And so we have to assess, you know, the risk versus benefits. We did not give her a systemic antibiotic as well with that, with the minocycline. We just applied that topical for her and and it did work if it didn't work I would have considered going with a systemic antibiotic as well one of the things with this is it does stain if you have any patients that are kids or pregnant patients you know it's going to stain the developing tooth it is a tetracycline and there was an effectiveness study down here with the ADA's recommendations where I love those by the way I just love the ADA evidence-based dentistry recommendations where they have they're in favor of doxycycline long-term as an adjunct. Weak evidence for an, another antimicrobial as an adjunct, and this is talking about systemic, and then expert opinion for a locally delivered antibiotic, like or locally delivered minocycline. And, and if you wanna read that article, you can find that reference there. And so how to use, I think we already talked about that. There's a lot of different protocols with minocycline that I found reading different articles. There are some people who do 100 milligrams, you know, um, every day for four weeks. There's people who do 50 milligrams twice a day for, and this is me, I do 50 milligrams um, twice a day for 14 days. Then they've got a protocol, which I am actually kind of considering having a loading dose after reading some of these articles. But um, I usually the what I use is the 50, but they also talk about 200 milligrams um, twice a day on day one, and then 100 milligrams twice a day for days 10 through 21. So lots of different protocols. Here's the references, so you can look and see, you know, what you think would be best for your patients and their individual situations. But but this is the one that I have had some success with when I do combine the systemic with the local, but sometimes I just use the local, which is the gel. And we already talked about how we use that. So there's some resources that you can use to learn a little bit more about minocycline and how it can be applied topically. Chlorhexidine gel is another thing, or, or chlorhexidine rinse, because a lot of my patients are not able to swish for 30 seconds or swish for a minute. Um, we have worked with a local pharmacy to compound a gel for us. There are gels. This perio aid is something that I got actually at a gas station in Germany, and it is a 0.12% chlorhexidine gel. And this is a bot... Sorry, I've been talking for a long time. My lips are kind of like meh. But um, this is a broad spectrum antiseptic. And so it goes in and it kills a lot of stuff. It kills gram positive, gram negative. It kills yeast. It kills fungi. It kills the good guys and the bad guys. Like it just goes in and kills. And so there is a really large Cochrane review that I've got the research for on one of these next slides that if you want to learn a lot about chlorhexidine, I found that to be a very useful article to learn more. But one thing I learned about with it is that let's get to this next slide here, is that the gel can be less effective because sometimes things in a gel component can bind up the active chlorhexidine molecules. So after reading that, I have now considered to talk to my pharmacy about maybe making that gel stronger, but I'm going to have to assess the risks and benefits. I'm used to the 0.12% gel and I'm very comfortable with that, but that's something I'm going to further look into is if maybe a 2% gel would be more effective. And of course, before I do it with any patients, I will be doing it on myself. Um, as far as effectiveness goes, there have been mixed reviews with chlorhexidine's effectiveness in caries, but um, I do think it helps. There are some studies that say it do, there's some studies that say it don't, you know, so make sure that you read through those studies and form the opinion for yourself. But I like to tell people to use it for 60 seconds because not only are there some studies that say it increases effectiveness at 60 seconds, if you tell someone to do something for 30 seconds, they're probably going to do it for like 10. If you tell someone to do it for 60 seconds, they're probably going to do it for 30. So at least it's more effective. But with our patients that can't, you know, swish and spit or patients that might, I mean, we have a patient that if you pour it for them, they're just going to take it like a shot and you don't want them to do that. So with the gel, at least you're having their caregiver rub it on there and they're not just, just drinking it. They say you can use it up to four weeks before you see staining. I 
That is what some studies have said. Personally, I think that you can see staining before that. I've seen staining before that. I've seen staining with regular use, even just like a couple of weeks. So I think all patients are different and it depends on, you know, like what, what is in their mouth? What is their bacterial profile? What is their pellicle like? Like, so I think that it really depends. And with every patient that I give chlorhexidine to, I tell them about the potential of staining and reassure them that that's something we can polish off. So I don't have as many sources on the chlorhexidine slide. And the reason for that is because there's 50 studies included in this and it's like a million pages. So after I read that, I was just kind of tired of looking at chlorhexidine stuff. And so I would say that there, I'm going to do further looking into it so that I can have more re references. But this is a really good starting point here. Sodium hypochlorite as a rinse is also um, an antimicrobial. It's a broad spectrum disinfectant. It destroys lipids, fatty acids, and activates enzymes. And the studies that we have, of course, you know, with a lot of these studies on some of these products, there's a higher risk of bias and less studies. So this is not to say that this there's a lot of peer-reviewed evidence for this. It's not to say that there's not either. It's just to say that I haven't found a lot. But the idea behind it seems like a good idea to me. When you have this disinfectant, the sodium hypochloride, going in and killing the bacteria, they also have xylitol, fluoride, and it's a high pH. So there's a lot of good things going on with this and a lot of good potential there. I don't know, you know, a lot of the studies that I've read were very small groups and so I'm, I'm just not sure, but it is something that I am considering trying for some of my patients because it, the biochem to me just makes sense. And the studies that I've seen have been in favor of it, albeit they have a high risk of bias and um, lower group or lower number of groups. But how you use this is you take, there's two different bottles and you mix the A and the B together and then you switch for 60 seconds and you're gonna do this twice daily for three to six months and then you'll switch over to a different regimen. This is harder in some of my patients because with sodium hypochlorite, we don't want them to be drinking. It's basically bleach. So we don't want them to be drinking bleach. So this is only to be used for some of our patients who are more compliant. The patients who are going to be able to mix two components together, the patients who are going to be able to, you know, that I will trust that they won't swallow it. It also talks about waiting an hour um, to eat or drink. And the reason for that they give is because it can cause staining if you eat or drink afterwards. And so people don't like that. There were some studies, and I have the studies up here that talk about the possible conflict with composite bonding. That I have not done adequate research in, but it's something to maybe look into. Um, it's not something that I've had to I've had to look into for myself, so I haven't looked into it. But it just was mentioned in one of the studies, so I thought it might be worth mentioning. But I think that there's a lot of promise in that as well. It's definitely something I'm going to check out. The idea of probiotics also makes sense to me biochemically, but is not something I've done a lot of research in and it is not something that I have used. But the idea of having commensal bacteria, so good bacteria in there to compete against the bad bacteria for food and space, the idea to have bacteria that are, you know, that will raise the pH. I mean, that's a great idea. If we can figure out what bacteria can be there, and if we can figure out what bacteria can do that, that's great. The one thing that I noticed in a lot of these studies as I went through those studies was that it's a very diverse spectrum of bacteria that are used in the products that I can find. So it looks like there's a lot of different options of which probiotic to use. And for that, I have not found a lot of evidence to say one over the other. There was one study that said things that use multiple different organisms can be more effective. But again, there's just not a lot out there that I can find that look like peer-reviewed studies to show the effectiveness for this. And again, if you guys have better information, please send it to me because these are things that I am looking into with coronavirus and things that I want to learn more about. One of the important things that I think with the probiotics, though, is that if you are using probiotics, antimicrobials kill everything. So if you're putting good guys in there and then you put something in your mouth that's going to kill them, like you don't want to pop a probiotic and then go rinse with chlorhexidine because you're going to kill those good guys you just put in your mouth and it kind of negates that idea. So you want to wait 30 minutes after any antimicrobial treatment and you don't want to do an antimicrobial treatment right after you take a probiotic or, you know, dissolve that probiotic in your mouth. A thing to be cautious with with probiotics is just immunosuppressed patients. So if you have a patient that's immunocompromised, I myself would be cautious in inducing anything, even if it is a symbiotic bacteria, because I just don't have the knowledge that I need to make that decision. And so I know a lot of these last slides, I'm, it's just me telling you things that I don't know, but I want to be honest with you and, and tell you the things I don't know. These are things I'm looking into and things that I, I do not have expertise on, but just ideas for, for all of us as dentists to research and to look into as we try to progress this preventative field here. 
but these are just some examples of probiotics that I found, and I've listed the um, the bacteria that are contained in there in those probiotics. And so, to me, that's just that's a diverse group of bacteria, and there's not a lot that are the same, you know. So I was just looking at that and thinking, okay, there's a lot for me to learn in this, and probably a lot for all of us to learn. And and whether it works or not, I'm I'm not sure. But it is it is something that I think is worth looking into because I think to me the biochemistry of it does make sense. Here's the references that I use to gain the information that I have for it. And then dry mouth. And we are actually almost through with all the slides. We have dry mouth and then dentures, and then we are through. But when we're looking in these long-term care facilities, a lot of our patients have dry mouth. And Dr. Brian Novi came to our dental association meeting at the Idaho State Dental Association, and he talked about these pilocarpine lollipops. And I am very excited to try those. I have not yet been able to because my compounding pharmacy is still in the process of figuring out how they want to make those and how they want to compound them. But they are in the process of doing that because I have used pilocarpine a couple of times for patients that have severe dry mouth. Um, there are a lot of different prescriptions that are recommended. And if you look at the Lexicomp, I love Lexicomp actually. In the long-term care facilities, this is one of the things that I just really like, this Lexicomp app here, because I can look up different doses, I can look up different um, drug interactions. And I, I don't know how I lived before this thing, but when I'm looking at taking the oral pilocarpine, which is what I have done, what I do is I have that five milligram pilocarpine and that patient breaks it up and she takes a little in the morning and then a little when she um, is starting to feel that her mouth is uncomfortably dry again. With that pilocarpine, she, there are negative side effects that she doesn't like. She says it makes her sweat like a man and it makes her wanna you know, wear her husband's shirts because she doesn't wanna pit out her nice blouses. And so pilocarpine is gonna stimulate the secretion of exocrine, gland, exocrine glands. And so it's not just going to be your salivary glands. It's also going to be, you know, your sweat glands. You're going to pee more. And so there's a lot of different things that can happen with pilocarpine that you may not like. So it's, it's something that I do when people have severe dry mouth, but it's something that I don't jump to as a first line. Other things you want to be careful with is liver failure. They, it does require different dosing if they have liver failure. If you don't want to stimulate secretion of exocrine glands in patients that have uncontrolled asthma because I have asthma and I know that like when I get a cold, it's even harder to breathe because of all the mucus and I have very well controlled asthma. So if someone is uncontrolled asthma, you get those exocrine glands secreting more mucus that can cause a problem for them. And there are some other risks that you can see here. Um, with pilocarping myself in a medically complex patient, I do a med consult just because it makes me happy. It makes me feel better. I have not had a doctor say to not do it. You know, and I've not had them recommend against it, but I like to just, you know, take that team approach to medications that I'm a little less familiar with. And this is one of them. And so this is, they recommend that you take the minimum amount to get the dose that you want. And so there is your pilocarpine as an idea there for dry mouth. Another thing you can do for dry mouth are lubricants. Lubricants can stimulate saliva in a way that they're just stimulating the saliva right then and there. Because any, you can put a marble in your mouth and you're going to get more saliva in your mouth. That's why when you deliver dentures, you know, you're drooling a lot. When you're putting the gauze in the mouth, you're drooling a lot because your body automatically thinks that this is, your body thinks that this is a uh, piece of food. So you're going to start stimulating saliva naturally. But flavors can help. And that's why a lot of people like time release sugar capsules or candies. And so some of the things that we use for lubricants is, you know, you've got your sprays, you've got your gels, you've got your rinses, and all of those things have a little bit more viscosity than water. So it's like mouth lotion. Patients that sip water all day, um, I read an article in one of the journals talking about cancer patients, and they talk about mixing a half a teaspoon with did it happen? Yeah, have, I always mix up teaspoons and tablespoons. I'm not a good cook. I'm actually really terrible. But um, you take a half a teaspoon, mix it up with the water, and shake it regularly because, of course, you know, oil and water will separate. But it actually does give the water a little bit more viscosity. And if you had a dry mouth, I could see how that would be more comfortable for patients. I've not done that with a patient. I've done it with myself. Um, but that is something that I'm considering recommending. Sometimes sprays are hard for people with arthritis to spray. So in those times, we would want to consider, you know, alternatives. So things like a gel might be hard to open as well. So there's a lot of different things that you have to consider patients' individual limiting factors. With a patient that has arthritis, you know, like the little unwrappy candies might be easier, but sugar-free and xylitol. So then that can help stimulate saliva. But a lot of different things you can do to help make them a little more comfortable with their dry mouth. Here's the studies that I had for the lubricants and the pilocarpine. 
And then antifungals. So we're going to see fungal infections in long-term care facilities. And you can use the, I don't even know how you say these, chokies, troches, I've heard it both ways. But the downside about the troches and the nystatin rinses are those are both chock full of sugar. And so, and I know why, because it's terrible tasting without it. If anyone out there has a product that has nystatin, that doesn't taste like feet, that doesn't have sugar, please email me that because I have been in search for that. I actually, with one of my compounding pharmacists, we tried to mix it and then we tasted it and it's real nasty. Like, like nystatin is real nasty. And so that's why it has sugar. I think that they said, I can't remember if it's 30% or 50% sugar in the nystatin rinse. And so, you know, when you have patients that have a fungal infection that also have teeth, that's something to be very cognizant about. And if we're putting a bad guy sugar in their mouth, I like to consider putting a good guy, like maybe getting them a prescription fluoride as well, because, you know, you're increasing their risk factors. We like to try to increase protective factors as well. I feel like the prescription for nystatin rinse can be really confusing because they talk about, like when you look at the LexiCompap, they talk about units, but really these units equilibrate out to about a teaspoon four times a day. Some say to swish and spit, some say to swish and swallow. I usually have them spit it out because the infection that I am trying to treat is um, in the mouth and I'm not... I'm not going back any further, but I don't think there's a problem with swallowing, and most of the prescriptions do recommend swallowing. We also want to treat the denture, of course, and I have them sit the denture in with the nice statin rinse as well. Let's see here. Oh, treating the commissures, of course, with the nice statin cream. And there's some information on antifungals. I feel like this is a marathon. It's it's really weird, by the way, you guys, like talking to you guys through the computer screen because I can't see you. So it feels like I've been sitting here for an hour and 30 minutes just talking to myself. So I apologize if it gets a little rambly. It's it's just, it's odd to be on this end of it. Um, so cleaning dentures. My idea with dentures in a long-term care facility is if they are happy, they are comfortable, and I'm not seeing fungal infections, I do not want to mess with their system even if I could improve it. Now, if they're not taking their denture out at night, I still want to mess with their system. Those tissues need a rest. But if they're using some product that they like, and I'm not seeing any infections and they're happy, I like to keep them doing exactly what they're doing. But if I'm seeing recurrent fungal infections, if I'm seeing recurrent problems, that's when I start looking at these weekly denture cleanings. This was an article that was, it was highlighted in the Pierre Frechard abstracts. And then I went and got the article from ADA and read the article. And there's, good and bad with doing this. And so we're looking at taking a 0.5% sodium hypochlorite for 10 minutes once a week, and it may affect the tissue color of the denture. So there is the side effect that could happen. It may affect that tissue color when soaking it. So you have to assess that risk, which may or may not happen. Not all of those um, acrylics are gonna be the same. So you wanna assess that risk with the benefit of disinfecting that denture. And so we do that for some of our patients, but not all of our patients. You don't want to soak it for any more than 10 minutes because there are multiple studies that say, and the ADA also in their recommendations for denture cleaning says, do not use it for more than 10 minutes. Um, chlorhexidine also can be a disinfectant for those dentures, but the risk that involved with soaking the chlor with chlorhexidine is that it can also stain some of the denture teeth. And so those were both things. I think that that was a study worthwhile reading and that'll be referenced in our studies here. You also want to be careful using a sodium hypochlorite if there's any metal because it can corrode the metal. And so you don't want to use any sodium hypochlorite on, you know, an implant retained denture or a partial that has any metal on it. There might be metals that don't corrode again, that I do not know. But just in general, um, I would not use that on something that had metal. So those are our denture cleanings. Here's some of the resources here for the denture cleaning. So in summary, um, for those of you who stuck on board, which good job, there's actually quite a few of you guys who are still stuck in around. Um, we went over the risks and benefits of our presence in the facility, and that's not to say you should or shouldn't go to your facilities. It's just providing you with information so that you can make the best decision for you and your patients. Every, every location is going to be different. Every situation is going to be different, and you really got to think through those situations and evaluate those risks and benefits to the facility, to your individual patients, and for yourself, you know, going into that situation. We looked at the long-term 
care um, facilities, their guidance from the CDC. So now we know what they're being told from the CDC to do. Um, if you didn't know that before, we looked at the, you know, the image for the families of us being considered essential um, employees or non-essential and in how that letter from the CDC may make us look a little bit like our services aren't essential and how to combat that with sending out a letter stating we are essential, but we do recognize the risks that way, the benefits. And we talked about forming a COVID action plan for the facility and how to be a part of that and what the components of that might look like. We talked about maintaining and improving regular oral hygiene, different ways that you can do that within your facilities. We talked about personalized risk and preventative plans. We talked about emergency teledentistry, and then we talked about how to deliver supplies and care packages to a facility and ways to work with administrators with that. Um, we talked about better snack choices, and we talked about topical medicaments. We wrapped it up with talking about dry mouth and dentures and I think that's about like as long as I can talk so we'll probably take a few questions except for I have one more slide for those of you guys who are members of the American Dental Association one of the most like un underutilized resources that I didn't know about until this last year is the library and archives and I have cited a whole bunch of different sources you know throughout this presentation because you know, we are all dental professionals, we are all smart people, we're all capable of making our own decisions, you know, when it comes to this treatment. We want to be able to get all those articles. And a lot of times you get on the internet and it's like pay $44.67 to read this article and you're like, eh, I'll just read the abstract because you don't want to read, you know, you don't want to pay $44. You don't have to. If you're a member of the ADA, you send an email to this link that I've got right here, this um, ADA library or the library at ADA.org and tell them the article you want to read and they'll ask you for your member number. They'll check and make sure you're an active member. If you're an active member, they will send you that article. And I have never once had them send me back anything that says we don't have that article or we don't have access to that article. So if you ever want to read an article and it's going to cost you money to do so and you're a member of ADA, just ask them for the article. It'll either save you 40 bucks or actually allow you to read the entire article. Um, the ADA also has COVID resources and I found that to be really useful as well and that's the website for their COVID resources. I know this class isn't necessarily on COVID but I just thought that those are the two resources that I use so regularly and I just want people to know that they exist. I like to say thank you to my team. Without my team we would not exist. Vonda is a retired dental hygienist who came back into the dental force and she works with us as an assistant. She has so much knowledge and she has helped us not only in you know, building the practice as an assistant, but she's also helped with a lot of practice management stuff. She's wonderful. Um, Mariana is a more recent grad out of dental assisting school. She is super smart, really innovative. She comes up with great ideas. She does CrossFit, so she's like real strong and we're a portable clinic. So like her strength is super helpful with some of our bigger equipment. We've got Holly. Holly works at the Federally Qualified Health Center with me. She is a brilliant hygienist. She does a wonderful job with hygiene, and she also has a lot of good knowledge with medically complex patients. I've seen her handle two different situations where we had medical emergency, and she handled them great. After doing that, I was really excited. She wanted to work with us as well, and so she works with me in two capacities. Jing Jing is a recent graduate from the College of Southern Idaho Hygiene School. She is, um, I just, I just love Jing Jing. She volunteered with us for Special Olympics, because what we did before was all special needs and then we incorporated geriatrics. She volunteered with us for multiple things. I really hoped that she would apply and then when she applied, I was super glad. She can communicate with people who are nonverbal so well. She does an excellent job. A lot of our patients who are nonverbal really relate to her. And I think part of that might be because English is her second language. Um, I think that she may have like a different understanding for those folks, but she's been excellent. Savannah, Savannah is a student right now at the College of Southern Idaho. She's our regular oral hygiene assistant. She's helped us develop this program. And she is just an incredible person. Before doing boards, you know, she had her board she had to go take and that's real stressful. And before boards, she still came out to the facility. She still did everything on top of her schoolwork. And she comes up with some great ideas. Um, actually, the video we'll show you at the very end is one of the videos that Savannah made. So here's my contact information. We'll take a few more questions. Um, if you want to stick around to watch a couple of videos, um, one is informative on taking care of people with aspiration risk. It's two minutes because that's our rule for videos. And the other one is more minutes and it's my video for the state of Idaho talking about silver diamine fluoride and applying that you know, as a topical medicament through teledental supervision, the SDF video is me. I basically take a shot of the stuff, so it's gross. But if you want to watch me do that, stick around after questions. 
All right, Dr. Brooke, thank you so much for a great presentation. We had a lot of comments coming in saying that you were just a wonderful speaker. So thank you for the great presentation. And thank you all for joining in. We're going to um, have questions referred to your email, which is on the screen there. So if anybody has any additional questions afterwards, as Dr. Brooke said, feel free to reach out to her through her email. And then again, your CE certificates will be sent out to everyone in about two hours. And if you need assistance finding access to any of the pre-recorded webinars that we have on our website, you can visit it at, again, at www.elevateoralcare.com slash elevatingcare. You can also reach out to our customer service at 877-866-9113. On our website, you can also find a button to request an informative staff meeting for your office. Education on the latest oral health prevention is what we do, and we can't wait to get back to what we do best, helping you serve your patients. So be sure to visit our website. Um, thank you all again for joining in, and have a wonderful day. And Dr. Brooke, I'll let you share your videos at this point. Perfect. And this screen share is new for me, so I apologize. If I Let's do the um, short clip first, because it's short. Welcome to Special Care Short Clips and Tips with your special smiles. Today, Savannah is going to talk to you about avoiding aspiration when cleaning teeth. Aspiration is when something gets into the lung that is not supposed to be there. Food debris, gastric secretions, oral secretions are some examples. This can cause problems in the lung, such as inflammation or infection. In patients with a high risk of aspiration, it's best to keep them upright or semi-upright. So prior to starting any brushing or any treatment, if you can adjust their positioning, um, that would minimize their risk. This illustration shows how an upright or even slightly leaning forward position can decrease aspiration risk when performing oral care. Another thing to consider in patients with a high risk of aspiration is to control the amount of water that is used whether that's in a cup or a water pick or anything else. And so something that I found to, that helps with the water pick is to keep your finger on the power button and keep turning it on and off to minimize the amount of water that is in the mouth at all times. To assess oral care aspiration risk, do they have impaired swallowing? Do they need their liquids thickened? Do they use a feeding tube? Do they have GERD or frequent vomiting? And do they have a history of aspiration? If the answer to any of those are yes, they're probably at higher risk for aspiration. Thank you for taking the time to learn about aspiration. Special Care Short Clips and Tips is a series of short videos produced by Your Special Smiles to help dental care professionals feel more comfortable treating patients who have complex medical histories or disabilities. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and we look forward to producing more. Special thank you to Ms. Savannah Hendren, our regular oral hygiene provider and soon to be RDH. And, and so with that tip, you know, we're considering that Savannah is our daily oral hygiene provider. So she's providing daily oral hygiene. So she's using tools and equipment that she would be using and that caregivers would be using. So this is her tip for the caregivers. Now I'll show you our other video here. This is the video for Idaho. Let's see, where is it? And this one's kind of funny. Maybe. Let's see. There it is. And I just want to show you how, what happens if you do a really bad job when putting this on yourself. Okay, so here I've got a unit dose of SDF. I've got my little applicator here. So I'm going to dip it in and I'll show you. See, it's all nice and wet, a lot of SDF on it. I'm just going to stick it all over the place. I'm going to do a terrible job. Get on my lips. 
Blow my tongue. Get a little more. Get on my tongue. Oh, that's terrible. Tastes terrible. If I had a cavity there, it would turn dark. You can see I don't have any lesions there. I might get a little bit of dark staining that'll polish off, but really very minimal adverse effects for patients. I think with patients in this social isolation, and if they do have active caries, and we do a teledental consult, if I were to supervise my patient, and they were to put this on live while I was watching them and telling them how to do it, of course I would have them properly do it. I would have them dry everything off. I would um, tell them to isolate it as well as possible. But really, if they do a bad job like I just did right here, take a look. Really no damage, and I'll show you a picture in a little while of what happens over time with it. I don't know if you can see that, but just about a minute later, you can see just a little bit of tissue sloughing. Can you see that in there? It doesn't hurt, but you can definitely feel there's a little bit of tissue burn, a little bit of sloughing. So this is the next day after I applied the SDF basically all over in my mouth to my teeth and all my soft tissues. And last night when I ate an orange, I felt just a little bit of burning on right in my vestibule, like right down in there. But then today you can see, you can see that most of the staining is gone. I'll take a few still photos as well so you can see them better. But I don't even feel anything at all in the vestibule and I can eat the orange and it doesn't burn me anymore. The adverse effects, if done improperly, are slight tissue burning, decreased effectiveness, and staining of other areas. But what happens if a patient drinks it before they contact you? So now we're going to look and see what happens if I just dump the whole thing in my mouth, which is going to be gross, so um, you're welcome, because nobody try this at home. It is nasty. Pop the little top off. Here we have it. Okay, it's going to be really gross. I can't even do it. It won't come out. Like you can't just take it and take a shot of it if you wanted. Yeah. Oh, there it comes. Woo, ha, gross. Whole thing's on my tongue. Ha. Yeah, that's real nasty. Whew. Fill it in my nose a little bit. Really gross. Just a little color on my tongue. Nah, I'm gonna get a drink of water because that's way gross. Nobody's gonna keep that on there. So I'm gonna get a drink of water. I just went to the kitchen to get a drink of water because that was really nasty. A little stain on my tongue. Tastes bad. Feel it a little bit. Yeah, I can definitely feel it a little bit, but you get nothing too bad. Not, not nearly like what it would be if you put hydrogen peroxide on a wound. It's just, it's, it's kind of bad. But there you see it. Dumped it on my tongue. We'll show you again tomorrow what that looks like. Just because we have this pandemic with the coronavirus does not mean that caries is going to stop growing. And that's a problem. We need to make sure that we can take care of our patients and that we can minimize the increase in caries or minimize the size of those caries while we're not able to physically see them. So the question is, how do we do that? And the answer really is one, teledentistry. We need to be monitoring those patients remotely as much as we possibly can. Two, the ADA has come out with guidelines for non-surgical management of caries. And we want to look at those very seriously right now, as we're in a time when surgical management of caries is not a possibility in most cases. We're going to have to turn to that non-surgical management of caries, and one of those things is the utilization of silver diamine fluoride. So please reference that article, look at that article, read that article, and learn the different ways that you can help manage your patient's caries in a non-surgical manner. One of the proposals we have is to mail these kits. And the kit would have a little two by two so they can dry it off. The kit would have either the instructions from the manufacturer or something that the provider has typed up themselves, also with the instruction of do not do this 
without me being with you on video. So you want to make sure the patient understands that this is supposed to be a two-way interaction while they're applying it. And then I'll grab some of the other things here. They would also be sent for little tiny spots and approximately the little tiny micro brush. For larger lesions, the larger micro brush and a single unit dose. You can put that all in a plastic bag, put that in the mail, send it to the patient. They get that, they call you through teledentistry, you watch them or your hygienist watches them apply it. And then we're able to at least manage that lesion a little bit more. And so some of the key points not to misunderstand that video that don't do that because in your state that's probably not legal so don't go and mail this to patients just because um, some girl on a webinar thought it was a good idea um, make sure that that's something that you could do in your state if you're considering that and also another thing that could be a problem with silver diamine fluoride going out is getting it in the eyes and I, in, in my opinion, we can counteract that with that synchronous teledental supervision and making sure that they only put it on the micro brush, making sure that we're not utilizing it in patients where there is a risk to get it in their eye, but only those patients that we trust could be cooperative enough and could be compliant enough to be able to do this safely. So it's, it's not without risk. And so it's not like we want to just paint the world with it. And it's not like we want it to be like on the Walmart shelf or anything. We still want this to be something that is supervised and closely supervised by you, the dental professional. And you still have to assess those risks and benefits with getting it into your eye is a serious risk. And so you want to make sure that you're doing that responsibly and appropriately. I know that some people had watched that video previously and thought that I was advocating for people to just send this to all of their patients and that's not at all the case like yes as a as a big girl I can take a shot of that and as most I don't treat little kids and so most of my patients could drink the whole thing and not have a problem but if it gets in their eyes that is a problem and so we do want to recognize that don't send it to patients that you don't trust to do it appropriately um, I think that concludes all that I've got I look forward to some emails hopefully some of you guys have some nice statin rinses that don't have sugar in them that'd be awesome um, Honestly, I have no idea what you're looking at now, if it's a screen or my email address. I'm, let's see if I can go monitor number two. Hopefully that's my email address up there. Um, any other comments? I think that concludes it for us today. Thank you so much and thanks for sharing those great videos. Well, thank you. You guys are a wonderful host and I appreciate it. All right, everyone have a great day. Thank you.